All right, so um, we're live. I'm here with Amanda Hudishell. Uh, Amanda Hudishell is one of my favorite animal rights activists and just one of my sort of favorite people to gain insights about speciesism and anti-speciesism from. Um, she is a co-founder of Species Revolution, which is an organization that works to educate people about speciesism, the things they can do to dismantle human supremacism in their own life. She's also a, um, an undergraduate student right now in philosophy and also um, nonprofit management. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, over at, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot the university where you are. Where are you studying? No, you're fine. Cleveland State University. Yeah, Cleveland State University. And she's a campus representative for PETA. Um, so thanks so much for, for, for joining me. Um, you know, huge fan. I've, I've enjoyed getting to know you over the last couple of years a little bit. And I think it's going to be a really fun conversation. So first, just thank you. Thanks for being here. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Aaron. Yeah, you're welcome. <clears throat> so why don't we just start by talking about um, your history as an activist. So just like sort of how you got into to activism. What was like early activism like for, for Amanda? Uh, well, I think like my very first animal rights protest is um, actually like outside of Ohio. I was traveling for um, other reasons and happened to be near Baltimore um, for the like annual empty the tanks um, protest that happened like all over um, the country and the world. And so I got to protest the National Aquarium um, for that. And so I think that that's like a, a pretty cool way to like enter um, the movement was such a like iconic location uh, and then went back home uh, started hearing about circus protests and uh, you know that kind of thing and just got involved with the community um, and uh, DXC was like the first um, organization probably that I was a part of but I also was um, a on the youth advisory board um, for PETA back when they were PETA II uh, during my senior year of high school. Um, so I got involved in activism like the summer before my senior year. Uh, and uh, by the time you know I was applying to colleges, that was something that I was um, thinking about uh, with my college decision, wanting to make sure that I went somewhere um, that it was a pretty big reason why I wanted to go somewhere urban, you know, so that there was um, kind of an outside vegan community uh, in addition to hopefully like finding other vegans on campus. But I really wanted to keep up with being able to um, protest and, and things like that um, after I graduated high school. Um, and yeah, so I, I joined, uh, I've been, a, this is my third year um, being a PETA campus rep and I love it so much. Uh, and I uh, love being able to do uh, like fun, uh, positive things on, on campus um, because that's, uh, that's like most of the work that, that we do uh, with our student org. And because some of the other activism that I do uh, is obviously um, you know, more, more serious and intense and so being able to have, you know, good interactions with people, giving them free, you know, samples of vegan food uh, is kind of an uplifting side of the work. Awesome. And why don't we <coughs> start oh, by I just kind of going, oh, Aaron. sorry. Yeah. Awesome. So I love that story. Let's start by just going through some of like the early activism. So the first thing you did was protesting some, some tanks, right? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. So what exactly did that entail? What, what did you do? Uh, it was a pretty basic uh, protest with, uh, like, there were a lot of us. I mean, it's cool to have been, like, part of a bigger protest for, like, my first thing. I think there were probably, like, um, 30 or 40 of us, uh, and uh, which, you know, is on the bigger side for animal rights things <laughs> in, in most cities. Uh, and, yeah, I think that there were probably some people leafleting uh, and... Uh, I'm sure I made my own sign. I can't even remember like what it was now, but um, yeah, you know, it's like protesting captivity uh, uh, for sea animals and uh, yeah. Cool. And, and so you're just basically like holding signs talking about the, you know, the captivity of the sea animals. Mm -hmm. um, that's cool. And then, so you, you talked a little bit about like, like DXC, but so somehow you went from there, from holding signs yeah. to doing what I think of as one of like the most iconic, um, 
DXE Disruptions, which is the Nathan's Hot Dog competition, which you disrupted twice. Mm -hmm. um, first, like, could you talk a little about that? So, like, what exactly happens there? Um, what was sort of the thinking behind what happened there? And how did you go psychologically from holding a sign to, like, risking, you know, getting, like, like arrested, right? Because you, you guys got arrested by the police. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that was um, about, like, a little over a year um, from my very first protest to being arrested at Nathan's for the first time. And, um, you know, I think my, my first uh, DXC disruption, like, you know, in a Whole Foods was actually like Thanksgiving weekend, like of that year. Um, and I remember, you know, learning about like open rescue and DXC had, had done an open rescue that we were, you know, referring to in our protest and whatnot. Um, and uh, it was, definitely something like very new to me. I didn't even really know what I was getting into when, you know, I arrived like at the Whole Foods for the protest. I'd never even been into a Whole Foods before um, for shopping or anything because my, um, where I grew up uh, doesn't have Whole Foods. So I like drove up to Cleveland an hour away uh, to, to disrupt them. And um, so that's amazing. So your first time in a Whole Foods was to disrupt it. Yeah, yeah, it, it was like a while, like before I actually went shopping at Whole Foods after that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah. I can relate. The first time I was ever inside of a Costco was to disrupt it also. Oh, same. Actually, yeah, first yeah. time. Nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I don't actually think I've ever shopped at Costco. So like I've been in Costco like twice or whatever. And both of them, <laughs> both times. Were, and that was actually another time that I got cited i didn't get we didn't get arrested but we did all get charged with disorderly conduct uh outside of our costco so. got it good okay yeah, yeah. So, so back to that like dxc disruption of the whole foods yeah. first time inside of a whole foods um what was that like for you just like inside of your head walking into the store knowing what you're about to do um i mean i i don't really remember feeling like super nervous or anything like that i think i just felt like like this made sense to me. Like I, I was also like with, um, I think I brought like four other people with me um, that we, we all drove up together. And, uh, and I, I know that there was like varying levels of anxiety, but to me, it's just like, this just makes sense what we're doing. Like this is, this is an emergency uh, and we have to um, have to be talking about it. And, uh, so it didn't really even, I don't think it really clicked with me that like what I was doing was technically illegal or any of that. I mean, I was still, uh, I, I was not an adult yet. I was 17. Uh, so who even knows like what would have happened if, um, you know, I don't think that really we ever had any interactions with, um, with police at that point. Eventually, like when I be, became an organizer and like, um, a year after that or so, we ended up like having issues with police and being kind of worried about having to just go in and go out. And uh, because we only had three whole foods, so we had to like kind of rotate going around and like, um, you know, once you start going back again and again. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I think that, that you know, I, I became an organizer with DXC uh, Cleveland. Uh, just a few months. I was still a senior in high school. Uh, so just a few months after my first disruption, basically, I think it was like, I decided to go to school in Cleveland. And so that was, you know, we knew that I was going to be staying in the area. And so, um, so uh, they, they decided to invite me into the team. And, uh, and it just made sense to me, I guess. Like, I don't even remember thinking about it being like a controversial animal rights tactic or like anything like that. Um, and, uh, you know, I was still just like newbie vegan and that like, I just want to do what I can to help. And so, um, yeah, I don't think that it was, you know, I, I went to, I signed up for going to the DXC forum that year. Um, and that's where like a lot of things changed for for me in many different ways that's you know where i met abhijit 
Um, and that's where, um, you know, I did the biggest protest, was involved in the biggest protest um, that I had ever been a part of up until then. Um, and I, I don't think that it was really until then that I started to be around, you know, so many other like-minded people and like started to kind of get this whiff of like, oh, not like there are a lot of people in, in animal rights and in veganism that think that this is just crazy what we're doing uh, because it, it's just always like, I don't know, there are people doing this and I want to help. And so this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I, um, I, I love that. And I think that like there, there's a lot of really specific things to your story. So like one thing is that you weren't afraid. Every time I've done a disrupt, like we've disrupted most of the grocery stores in, in, in Madison. Um, and usually the role I've played has been just to be the videographer. And mm -hmm. even doing that terrifies me. Like when I walk into a store, I know that disruption is about to happen. It's just, I get this feeling like, like we're going to be breaking some social norms. And it's mm -hmm. really hard for me to do that. So like even just walking and holding the camera, even though I'm not going to be doing a speak out, is something that makes my heart like just go pitter patter. Um, mm -hmm. The one, I think I only did a, I, th I did one speak out. Um, it was at one of my first grocery store disruptions. And that was like, super intense because you have like a manager yelling in your face and i think yeah. to just to be able to do that to really go through all of that and just have this sort of stoic um attitude where it's just like you know this makes sense this is the right course of action which seems to be like what was going on with you when you were a, a senior in high school is is really kind of um amazing really really envious um oh, and really like you. impressed that's really <laughs> awesome thank you i mean i'm not sure i even knew when i got into it like really knew that I like should be afraid <laughs> I guess I just like really had a lot of um like confidence in in the organizers and just like oh they'll just handle it if something goes wrong and I guess like uh I don't know I guess there's just that feeling of like being around um other other people that like oh well I'm not alone because like when I've done oh my goodness like the couple of times that I've done like solo disruptions Oh, that's like, that's kind of freaky. <laughs> uh, so, but I guess like, you know, uh, being around other people, um, I, I think that that's just, um, yeah, it, I felt like pretty okay. Thank you. That's a great compliment yeah. to hear. <laughs> and so, so solo disruptions, that's where you like, you go and it's just you and you're disrupting like our stores or restaurant or something, right? Yeah. Wow. And like, one thing I want to ask you is like, so it seems like it just made sense to you to do the thing. I imagine that when you did the solo disruptions it was a similar sort of thing or just like it made sense. Um, why are disruptions like, like how do you see disruptions playing a role in actually leading to social change? And do you still see them playing an important role? I definitely still think um, that they are effective and um, an important aspect of the movement. I mean, I haven't done one in a while. Uh, I guess the last one that I would have done would have been at the um, Cleveland Animal Rights Conference that we organized last summer. Uh, but that was, you know, and um, like we, you know, had, Abhijit and I had learned a lot from DXE and we wanted to keep a lot of the great things that we had learned and experienced. And so we did a disruption um, of there's this like really iconic like meat market in Cleveland. Um, and uh, back in the DXE days, we had done a couple small disruptions of it, but we decided to, uh, we did a National Animal Rights Day ceremony and then uh, basically like finished out with a procession, like with flowers into the market, just, you know, to make the statement of like, we just did this funeral for all animals. Um, but, um, you know, the, for animals who we had like specific names for predominantly and, and carrying that, you know, into um, to a place where animals' bodies are that who will never be recognized. Uh, uh, if, if, if we don't go in and recognize them. So, um, so yeah, I, I still think, I think that they're more powerful when you have more people and that like, obviously we should always be thinking about like um, our efficacy and like, if you have more people, you're more likely to get that news coverage, which we did for that event um, and things like that. But I think that, I mean, this is, uh, 
like animal agriculture is, um, I mean, it's, it's an atrocity, like uh, unlike anything else. And so um, sometimes I think that, you know, people who are against disruptions just don't really think about the fact that in a lot of, um, in a lot of ways, this is just like the natural emotional response that someone should have to being around dead bodies uh, and to say something about that. And so it, it isn't all um, just trying to get press, uh, trying to change someone's mind right there. Some of it is just like, this is what they deserve. Yeah, or yeah. And um, just to focus on that. So you, you're talking about like like mock funerals, right? Like you sort of, you <laughs> hold the funerals. We participated in a mock funeral together back in 2017 because that was the only year I ever went to the DXE forum. Right. And I think that was yeah. your last year going to, to Berkeley for, for DXE things. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I remember we all like marched from, uh, from, from Berkeley fr down over to the local Whole Foods and we gave a, um, and they were carrying some bodies who had been, you know, of, of birds who had been, uh, I guess, taken from, from farms that supplied Whole Foods. Mm -hmm. And then um, with, with that many people there, it did feel like we were just giving authentic expression to things that we were feeling and which we often suppress. Mm -hmm. um, and I love that. And I think there's something to be said for developing your character in such a way that you're responding honestly to the things that are around you. Um, mm -hmm. We were taught to see these things as just like, well, taught to see bodies as just any other sort of food stuff. But once you actually see what's actually going on, um, is disruption can be an authentic expression of what any good person should be feeling. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, because we often just coach it in like tactical terms. We're often just thinking like, okay, like how is this disruption going to further the goals of this particular campaign? But I think the way that you're framing it is, is really powerful because it's it's not simply looking at these sort of tactical considerations. It's also looking at what kind of character we want to have and like what kinds of people we are and how does a virtuous person respond to this kind of um, injustice, this mass injustice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Cool. Um, okay, cool. So we talked a little bit about like sort of the early part of your career as an activist, like 2016, 2017. Um, and we were sort of moving from DXC over to like the Nathan's disruption. Um, what was that like? What was that like to actually do? Uh, wow. It was, um, <laughs> it is in some ways just uh, indescribable. I mean, it was probably uh, one of the worst days of my life, but I also think that um, I like grew a lot as an activist uh, and just as a person. Um, I had just turned 18 a couple months before that. And so, uh, just, uh, and like was, you know, planning on going to college in a couple months. It's just, you know, kind of that like transitioning point in, in my life. Um, and so I had just been to the DXC forum and been very inspired and participated in the um, disruption of Bernie Sanders uh, at the end of the forum. Um, and uh, I wasn't uh, one of the ones to get detained there, um, but uh, you know, I had the experience of like waiting in, in line for hours and hours to like do this thing that lasts just a couple of minutes. Uh, and, and Nathan's was such a dramatic version of that. It was so hot. Um, it was so long and, uh, everyone was just miserable and, um, <laughs> and yeah, I mean, you just like, uh, it's a free event. So people line up, you know, super early. And then once you get into, they open up this area, like in front of the stage. And once you're in that area, you like can't really leave to go to the bathroom because you would lose your spot. And so, uh, you know, you're trying to like monitor your like basic bodily functions just to like get through uh to the disruption itself and then uh three of us were arrested and uh for jumping up on stage and throwing fake blood on the hot dogs and uh yeah I'd say that um being in jail 
was um, we were in jail for 12 hours. And uh, yeah, I, I think that, that that definitely opened my eyes in a lot of ways to uh, a, a lot of things. Um, like we, we saw um, uh, someone who wasn't with us, someone else who like uh, was arrested that day. We uh, saw him uh, basically like um, be extremely roughly he was a person of color and he was extremely roughly handled by the police because he like wouldn't um let them take his fingerprints and and things like this that just like you know I knew about in the abstract but then uh experiencing these things firsthand uh being you know monitored if one we could uh go to the bathroom like not we were like not allowed to go to the bathroom for a long time, not being allowed water for a long time. Uh, we didn't eat the whole time we were in there because they didn't have vegan food to provide us. Um, so pretty like, and now that I've, you know, been friends with more, more and more people who have been arrested and uh, in this time, like pretty um, straightforward story, I think for anyone who's spending that long of a period of time in jail, but definitely something I was not prepared for <laughs> at all. And uh, we didn't know what we were being charged with. We didn't know if we had even like made the news. Like we didn't know if this is like, were we in here for no reason? Like, was it worth it? Turns out it was worth it. And actually uh, a cop, like when we met, made it to central booking, uh, like uh, low key just showed us like, hey, is this you guys? Like it showed Wow, us that's stuff. amazing. You got some fans <laughs> on the inside. Yeah, yeah. So we like, you know, that was kind of like a little bit of like comic relief in the whole to know that, okay, well, at least we're in here for a good reason. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it was a very terrifying uh, experience in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I'll bet. And when, so you, I mean, you study philosophy, so you probably have read some things about like why we think we use punishment and stuff. And there's like, like one of the ideas is that punishment is supposed to make people less likely to commit the crimes in the future. <laughs> um, and what I wonder is like, was your time in jail, did that radicalized you or did that sort of move you far like did that move you more towards doing more radical action in the future or to discourage you well i was there a year later so right. uh I, I guess it radicalized me because it didn't work <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah i actually wasn't planning on uh i I was planning on, I mean, I uh, was the main organizer for when we went back in 2017, um, but I was not planning on risking arrest. I was planning on filming, but then like we ended up uh, with, the, with the number of people that we ended up with and the different roles that people could take. It was like, okay, I, I guess I'll uh, risk arrest again, risk, risk arrest again. Um, and then I was arrested again. And, <laughs> uh, so yeah, although that time it was much shorter and we actually were not charged with anything and then um, filed a lawsuit against them for arresting us for no reason because um, we weren't doing anything wrong that time. We didn't jump up on stage. Uh, we just uh, like two of us got onto two other activist shoulders and like pulled out a banner um and it's like you know free uh it's you know it's free to be there like we were there like uh, we had the right to be there just as much as anybody else did and so um yeah and they but they like still very violently you know like pushed us down into the ground and is, is that um, lawsuit still uh, pending yes <laughs> okay cool yeah, well, fingers crossed yeah. i hope you, you succeed thank you yeah it's been over two years and uh, you know thanks Take awesome. Long, this kind of thing. <laughs> yes, we have one comment from Britt. So Britt says, hi, very happy to listen along. I'm not acquainted with Amanda or her activism. So thanks for having her on. Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Britt. Um, if anybody else has any questions while they're watching this, feel free to leave them in the chat and we'll actually respond to them uh, live. So I guess one of the reasons why I wanted to, you know, sort of really delve into your early history in activism was to kind of get a picture of like sort of like the early Amanda before Species Revolution, because um, mm -hmm. it's a little bit similar to Ronnie Lee's trajectory, where like Ronnie founded, he was one of the co-founders of the Animal Liberation Front, 
And I had mm-hmm. him on here a couple of times and he would tell stories about like what you're doing wasn't as like aggressive as him, but he would talk about like, you know, somehow the first shop down the street from him kept getting like vandalized and, and stuff and like the kinds <laughs> of like, you know, ALF stuff. And mm-hmm. um, nowadays what he does is much more gentle where he does like street activism. Mm-hmm. Where he talks to people about vegan conversations, um, still gives like really fiery speeches, but there was a definite sort of trajectory in his, in his history as an activist. And there's some sense in which like something similar has happened with you where you started out doing these like, you know, disrupting Nathans. And now the the primary stuff you do is sort of to educate people about speciesism and the way that speciesism functions as an ideology. Um, And sort of as a way of getting into that part of your life, um, could you tell tell us a little bit about how you transitioned from doing the really more like DXC style stuff to uh, founding a species revolution? Yeah, um, so... uh... Abhijit and I were both still in DXC when we founded Species Revolution, Um, and I definitely don't think um, that really, um, you know, the the tactics at all are um, in opposition in any way. I think that that they can totally, like, uh, work hand in hand, and that's like what we did with the um, Cleveland Animal Rights Conference, but I think that uh, there comes a point in every activist career where hopefully you're kind of like taking a step back and wondering, um, like it, realizing that you can't do everything. And um, so maybe it makes more sense for you to focus on a specific kind of activism um, and, uh, you know, put most of your time into that since we only have, you know, a finite number of hours in the day and so um yeah so i i think that ultimately uh what what led um us to come up with the idea of species revolution was that um we and this has kind of changed uh now like i uh in uh in comparison to being now uh like two and a half years or so from when we had the idea but we felt then that really not very many people were using the word speciesism and that vegans did not like have uh, a very good understanding of, of what speciesism was and so then if vegans don't know like how can we even expect the public to like have heard of the word know what the word means um, and so, uh, like at our very first tabling event, we were, um, at a veg fest and we we're asking, you know, a predominantly vegan crowd, like, uh, are you familiar with what speciesism is? And most people said no. And so we, um, I think that that, uh, is changing, especially now that for the past few months, um, PETA has been doing an end speciesism campaign. Um, and they've really been focusing on that, which I think is great. Um, and so I think that as more animal rights organizations um, decide to prioritize that and um, at, at least be using the word, like in their videos or whatnot, even if that's not their primary focus is, is to you know be talking about what it means. Um, because I think that even just hearing it uh, will hopefully, um, you know, encourage people to look it up if they're not sure um, what all of that entails. Um, so, so yeah, but it's just, it's such a complex um, issue and to not be talking about it when it's the enemy of our movement. Speciesism is, is what we're fighting. Human supremacy is what we're fighting. Um, it, it's not just animal ag, like it's not just vivisection, like it's the um, system as a whole uh, and this mindset of, um, you know, uh, animals being less important and their interests and needs being um, less valuable than ours is the issue, the, under, the underlying issue here. Um, so, yeah, so I think that it was just a, a transition into feeling like, um, we identified this this problem, and we felt like the best way to try to combat that was through education, um, through educational um, blog posts and online resources, 
um, and and things like that. Um, because having you know, with such a nuanced topic, you can't. I, I personally don't think you know, like. Uh, and just like shouting in a grocery store, like end human supremacy without any like conversation about what that is, you know, obviously that's not necessarily the platform for that. Um, there's different platforms for different uh, animal rights issues. So yeah. got it. Awesome. So there's like a couple things. One of them is that we need to kind of like divide up our labor. So we need some people doing the disruptions. We also need other people doing the kind of anti speciesist education. And you have to sort of figure out where there's a need for you. And you sort of figured out that, I mean, I'm shocked to hear that, but all these vegans didn't know what speciesism was. Um, And and given that it's been like in this, you know, when animal liberation came out, that wasn't the first time that the word speciesism came out, but I think it was probably the most um, like widespread use of it. And that was, that was in like Mm -hmm. the seventies. I don't remember which, which year it was, Mm -hmm. but um, you know, decades ago. And even though it was such this, like such like a, you know, popular, like book that was supposed to be the foundation of our movement in many ways. Um, it didn't sort of, the word didn't sort of come out, like migrate out of that book into like the popular consciousness. And then we're just barely seeing it um, happen mm-hmm. today. So that sounds like a really good move. And I love the point about having diversity of tactics. I think it's, it's really important. Um, yes. So what is speciesism like precisely? Uh, so uh, simplified, we define it as uh, valuing human lives and human interests over non-human lives and non-human interests. And Abhijit has a wonderful, more complex uh, definition on on our website. Um, But um, basically, we want people to uh, focus on uh, valuing, like the fact that you know, we are putting our needs ahead of other animals. And uh, the idea that like every human as radically vegan as you want to be is still has speciesist tendencies uh, to varying degrees, of course. Um, But that it's basically like impossible um, to live a completely anti-speciesist life that we can, you know, strive towards that as much as uh, we possibly can. Um, But we really want people to put the focus on us rather than like the the other common like understanding of speciesism is like valuing certain animals over other animals. Like why would you love a dog but eat a pig? Um, But this isn't really encompassing the whole issue for a few reasons. One, because like obviously dogs are still really, really exploited. Uh, in, uh, in, in so many different ways. I mean, how can we even talk that way when there's so many like puppy mills and everything's still in existence? Um, but also that it just like shifts the focus from like our, like our responsibility in that like we, um, the problem isn't that like certain dogs are like, treated maybe in the way that we like more similarly to like the way we would like treat a fellow human friend the problem is that our whole society in so many ways uh is is founded for only the purpose of humans everything about our society is anthropocentric and that's what we need to dismantle good yeah i I love that and so just to you know, I want to really make sure I've, I've understood uh, the concept. So it's this idea that we value the lives and the interests of non-human animals less than we value the lives and the interests of human animals. Mm-hmm. That's that's sort of the, good. Um, and I want to I want to if I want to like poke and prod at it a little bit. Um, so like um, Tom Reagan, somebody who I think of as like one of the really important animal rights theorists. Mm-hmm. Um, he has this position that. If you're in like a lifeboat situation, you should save the life of a human versus the life of a dog. And the thought is that like, you know, the, the do- dogs deserve rights and it should be something where, where, where we look after their interests, we look after the rights. We don't just simply like they're not ours to use, they're not ours to test on, they're not ours to, you know, any of that stuff. 
but he thought that in lifeboat situations, it's still better to um, save the life of the human over the life of the dog, not simply because of what species they're in, but because of um, the level of like their cognitive sophistication and their ability to have certain kinds of, of interests. And so what I'm wondering is, would you say that that position is, um, is speciesist? Mm-hmm. Is that, okay, cool. I mean, yeah. I mean, I would disagree with for like so many reasons, but I think that having a blanket statement like that, like, uh, definitely arises out of like our own human prejudices because we're able to, um, you know, sympathize more with like other human beings and think that their lives like have more value because we're human. Like, why do you think we think that way? Because we're human. Like, and so to think that you're actually like, um, thinking about that objectively, I think that it's very hard to actually separate like, you know, our own, uh, inherent speciesism within ourselves, um, and, and separate that from, you know, uh, uh, you know, thinking about, uh, these, these kinds of things. Good. And like, since you do philosophy, I want to poke at this a little more than I might otherwise. Um, yeah. yeah. So like, there's this, there's this idea that having future oriented preferences means we're vulnerable to certain kinds of harms. So like if I value things that will happen to me in my future, that means that you can harm me by depriving me of having those things. But if I don't have future-oriented preferences, then um, I can't be harmed in those particular ways. And if that's right, then it seems like we can draw the line, not like on species membership, because there's going to be lots of humans who don't have those sorts of preferences. Mm -hmm. But it might turn out to be the case that we could um, put the life of your typical human over the life of your typical dog and not have it boil down to something that is um, intrinsically mentioning species, but instead Mm -hmm. pointed to some other property that we have independent reasons to think is morally significant. I mean, I, I feel like there's significant evidence to show that at least certain animals also, um, you know, value and can like plan their futures, uh, at least to to a certain extent. Uh, so, but do you want to ask just like hypothetically if that wasn't the case or? <laughs> yeah, suppose like, I mean, imagine if we have like, there's probably some animals who who don't like maybe mm-hmm. dogs do. I think like um, pansies, this pit bull who uh, lives with me. Um, and I'm never sure you'll have to help me out with the language that I should use. Cause I don't want to say she's my dog because I don't want to have this ownership thing. Um, mm-hmm. But, but she lives with me and I think that she like knows that she wants to take a walk later tonight. And yeah. if I don't go like inside after I finish this interview and take her for a walk, she's going to be very upset. So I think mm-hmm. she has this kind of future oriented desire and, and kind of goal. Um, but I imagine that there are probably some animals who don't have that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know enough about cognitive science to tell you which ones they are. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I suppose we yeah, take an animal I, like that. Right. Yeah. I think um, it's probably, uh, yeah, I don't really know much about that either, but I'd say that like, it might be likely that fishes don't. Um, so would obviously like I uh, care a lot about my fish companions and and all fishes. So, um, I mean, I I don't think that that matters enough to warrant uh, justifying taking someone's life. I mean, I, I see, um, the argument, but I think that, um, I, I don't think that it's reasonable grounds for saying, okay, your life matters less, um, in, in this situation because of that, because I think, I think that you could then end up and maybe this ends up like becoming a utilitarian slippery slope, but there you could always like uh, you know attach certain like okay well someone um, 
who there, I mean, there's just so many circumstances that you can add on, I guess, to like to different people's lives to say that there will be um, more of a ripple effect. And so I don't think, but I, I would really um, stay away from any arguments that like that rely on that specifically. And also, I mean, just I think that it's important uh, that I, we don't really talk about this in like mainstream animal rights or um, animal ethics, but I I think that it's relevant to talk about um, like the, the carbon footprint of humans and uh, and just the um, the disastrous consequences that like that humans have even even trying not to have any uh, consequence, you know, uh, even yeah. a vegan, it, it has very negative impacts on the other animals that are free living animals in society. Yeah. And just to sort of like, I really, I really want to be precise. So you're saying that goldfish versus human lifeboat scenario, I don't know how, what a lifeboat would look like where that would be the thing, but um, <laughs> right. to prefer the life of the human over the goldfish um, would be speciesist and, you, and you'd want to object to that even in that kind of trade-off scenario. Yeah, I mean, I think that obviously it's it's hard to like to talk to people about that. I think people mm-hmm. can put themselves in the shoes easily of thinking, well, if it was my dog companion versus some human I didn't know, then like a lot of people, a lot of non-vegans would be like, yeah, I'd save my dog, like you know. Uh, and most people, even people who live with goldfish, just probably won't do that. Um, but I think that in theory, like to, to talk about fishes as if they matter is like very important. And like, honestly, and if we, you know, talk about zoopolis, uh, later on, I mean, I'm just very concerned with, uh, the way that animal rights theorists, even people who are trying to improve on current animal rights theory, just do not care about fishes uh, and like care about them in theory, but don't actually like go out of their way to, um, you know, include them in, um, in their, um, in, in what they're writing out and in their theories. And so, um, yeah, I, I just would say that anything that you can do to try to disrupt that is important. Yeah, no, I, I I like that. I, mean, I love that you're consistent. One thing I want to point, and I also think it's not just that you're consistent; it's that you're fighting for something really important, which is that, oh, you. um, yeah, you know, we we don't think of we don't typically take the interests of fishes seriously enough. Um, mm-hmm. and one thing I want to point to is that I think you're, the conception of speciesism that you're pointing to is much more radical than the conception of speciesism that I typically read in the philosophical literature, because when a lot mm-hmm. of people use it, what they think is like. Species membership isn't itself intrinsically morally important. Um, and so what they might say is something like, well, a dog doesn't have a first-person psychological perspective where they have, like, they have a conception of, like, the referent I, where I can think, like, mm-hmm. I want to do this to me and I'm having this thought. Like, they don't engage in that kind of, like, metacognition. Um, and if you think that that is itself morally significant and that, like, that puts makes us vulnerable to certain kinds of harms to our certain kinds of dignitary harms and certain and, and if it's the case that like a death would harm me more than it would harm a dog simply in virtue of that then we should save me rather than save the dog simply out of um simply out of the thought that we should be impartial when we're figuring out who we're going to protect so the idea is like if we're just trying to minimize harms um, there's going to be some cases where preserving my life over the dog's life is going to accomplish that. And mm-hmm. it would be perfectly, it, it wouldn't be speciesist if it's correct that like that is actually how the harm is going to be um, <coughs> put out there. But I think what you're doing is you're taking this extra step, which is to say it's not simply that we want to be impartial um, and not take species to be morally significant. It's that we don't want to, tr- we don't want to ever treat um, killing one member of one species as being like worse than killing another member of 
like another species. Like we don't want to take killing a human to be worse than killing a dog. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, am I have, have I correctly like sort of pointed to the distinction between like the way that you're conceiving of it and some traditional less radical versions? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I yeah, cool. I just think that anything that I think that a lot of the time, like we just spend too much time like trying to figure out, okay, like in what hypothetical sense, like would would this be okay to like value a human? And I think that what we're doing is just trying to, uh, you know, make ourselves like feel a, a, like a little better about our speciesism and uh, and. And every, you know, everyone has like, uh, in all different fields has different ways of, um, you know, showing that. And that's, I think like philosophers, <laughs> I, that's like, I have a couple of criticisms about that in Zoopolis. Overall, I love, I love the theory that they put out, but sometimes I'm just like, you're trying too hard to like make, you know, taking eggs from chickens be okay. <laughs> like, so. Yeah, I totally get it. <laughs> Yeah, and let's talk about that for a second, too. So there's this thing that we do. This is a phenomenon that you've pointed to. And I've talked about this a little bit in some of my, my recent videos, where I think that a lot of people want to do stuff that they know they really shouldn't do. So they're looking to find some kind of a loophole. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that philosophers are always doing that when they say that the interests of humans could matter more than the, the particular like interest in life might matter more than someone else's interest in life. Because I think sometimes it's coming from a legitimate concern of thinking that um, having a first-person psychological perspective or having these sets of properties are themselves actually intrinsically morally significant. But I think that, I'll, but other times though, I think that that is actually happening and the, the person just sort of like looking for an excuse to like do the bad thing. Um, and we do this a lot in life too, where we're just sort of like looking for a loophole. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and like, so what do you see that happening in, um, in, in Zoopolis? So I think their explanation about uh, taking eggs from chickens and uh, using wool from sheep predominantly is, I'm just like, why are we spending so much time talking about this? Like, it, in the first place, I was just like, I just read like, I don't know, it takes up like three or four pages in the book. <laughs> I'm like, this definitely could have been better spent on something else on you know more specific examples um of like uh, of actually the positive rights instead of like adding an exception i think is just kind of um strange i think that um i i, I just don't i really don't understand the the purpose of it because i think that um I mean, I, i'm just wondering if I don't know why. I just feel like vegans tend to, like, er, animal rights people tend to be, uh, like, for different reasons, pretty understanding of, like, okay, we're not going to use chicken's eggs and we can feed them back to them. Or, like, in my opinion, like, we can implant them. Uh, but, like, why would we like try to figure out the exact specific situations where it would be okay to eat their eggs? Um, and so, yeah, I just find that strange because I'm not, I'm one, I'm just wondering like how many people even agree with what they lay out there in, in their explanation because obviously the book is directed um, towards like other vegans, other um, probably more like, uh, other people in animal ethics and so presumably that's an issue a more basic issue that people have probably already formed their own opinion on so um it, in comparison to all of the other wonderful um you know suggestions that they lay out lay out for people yeah um, let's well, just set that up a little bit because it's like a, it's a it's a long book <laughs> yeah. So, so because I, I imagine most people who watch who are watching this haven't read it. So we get it's this political theory of animal rights, and what they're doing is they're criticizing both the welfareists, who they think don't do enough to protect rights, and then the hardcore like animal rights theorists like Francione and Reagan, who say that animals just have a right to be left alone, and instead they want to have this kind of like um, this middle path where you get a whole bunch of rights to not be interfered with negatively. But in the case of domesticated animals, they want to have additional citizenship rights. 
So mm-hmm. like you get to participate in the determination of the collective good um, through dependent voting. So it's the same thing that we would do with people with like humans with, with intellectual disabilities where um, they get to work with other people to help them express their political will and you know vote. We do the same thing with, with non-human animals. And part of it is that they want to have space for mutually beneficial human, non-human and animal like interactions so like if a dog wants to play fetch with us and have companionship like we can we can do this kind of thing and then sort of in the midst of that there's this discussion of like whether chicken eggs and wool could be part of that lifestyle and i think the worry you're expressing is like well why like (laughs) like why are you looking for loopholes to eat eggs when it's so clearly the case that chickens shouldn't like as they exist today shouldn't exist like they you know given the um you know the, the the bone problems and given like their susceptibility to egg yolk peritonitis and reproductive cancers like um this shouldn't be happening um mm-hmm. so i think that it's it's just kind of wrong to be proposing like uses of eggs but i want to point to the wool one um there's a real problem that some sanctuaries have which is that like i, I know one person who runs an alpaca sanctuary and she has all these alpacas from when she used to have, like, she used to grow them for, like, the, their wool. And now she just has all this alpaca wool because she ha- you have to shear them because if you don't shear them, then they just get way too fluffy and it's not good for them. Um, and so she would, she would give it to all the, like, you know, all, all the birds in the area. She'd turn it into bedding. And then even after doing all these things, it was just this sort of, like, excess in wool. And it wasn't clear what to do with it. Um, and, like... First of all, like what did yeah what what advice would you give her? That's interesting because I mean I have always just like um, pointed to that as the alternative and like um, giving it to other animals. So I think that um, I mean I don't know I I, I guess I would just say like um, can like you know, do you have like volunteers who live in like other uh, like parts of your area where like they could take more of it to like their local birds or like that kind of thing? Um, Because I just think that anything that we can do to um, disrupt like human entitlement to, um, to anything that comes from an animal is important. And so I I view it in a sense of uh, kind of this like minor uh, example of reparations in a way, in that it's like, it's sort of this um, acknowledgement that what we have done to you is wrong. And so even if it doesn't like directly harm you for me to actually wear this, I want to try to show that I am sorry that you've been put into this vulnerable position. And so I don't think that it's my right to um, financially or, um, or even just, you know, wear this myself to, to benefit from that in any way, because it's my species fault that you're in this position. Yeah, I think I agree with you. Um, I think that, and I like that you sort of framed it as like there's no negative consequences to the to the alpaca, you know, if you use the wool, if, if you sell it. But like, it's a it's sort of like a symbolic gesture towards recognizing that we ought to be sorry for creating the situations in the first place. Yeah, I think another thing is that it um it doesn't maybe it doesn't harm the alpaca, but I think it harms me if I use it. Because, and it's, it has to do with something that uh, Martin Luther King talks about in Letter from Birmingham Jail, where he talks about how um, segregation harms everybody because it's, it, it's, it doesn't allow us to have this like mutual relationship where we see each other as equals. It kind of corrupts the character of both the oppressor and the oppressed. And it's mm-hmm. like the second that I use an animal product, even if it doesn't harm the animal, it's a situation where... I see them as for my use and that corrupts my character in a really pernicious way. Mm-hmm. And it also makes it hard for vegans who are going out and they're like, like imagine you have a vegan wearing like wool from this alpaca 
And then the conversation is something like somebody says, oh, I thought you were vegan. I was like, oh, no, I am. And it's like, well, like you're wearing wool. I was like, oh, no, I got this wool from like a nice farm. It's like humane. And they're like, well, wait a second. Oh, then like, oh, yeah, thanks. Like me too. I I went to a humane alpaca farm. Then you're like, oh, no, wait, no, it's not the same thing. Like mine was from a sanctuary. And the other one's like, oh, yeah, sure. It, it, mine was, it, was, it was like a sanctuary too. And then you get into like this, this kind of thing where you sort of destroy your dialectical position because you're no longer able to talk from a position of like abstention. Um, yeah. And so those are the two things that led to my advice, which was to like not use the will, even if it meant it's just piling up in, in, in your basement. Like it, it's mm-hmm. going to corrupt your character. Um, and it's also going to corrupt anybody else's character who participates in it. And it's going to uh, make things really hard for vegans having conversations about it. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Because, like, in, I mean, I think for, like, any purposes that we're talking about this in a, reali- in a realistic sense, we're talking about a society that's still speciesist. And so, like, anything that you can try to do to like alleviate that is important i mean i think that and maybe it's possible that that's like why zoopolis feel uh, like that the authors of zoopolis feel like uh that's less important because they're kind of talking about this in this like theoretical sense of like animal citizenship which in itself is like super we're probably not gonna get there (laughs) like very soon and so um so uh, like probably their response would be like well if you're talking about this perfect like relationship ideal relationship between humans and non-humans and whatever but like i don't know i mean we've been doing this for you know like at least two thousand years or like whatever since like we've domesticated animals like I think that it's probably the least that we can do to just not do that. <laughs> yeah, no, good. And I want to try to motivate the zoopolis position for a second, to like see why we might want to do that. And it's this idea that like we need to have like mutually beneficial relationships kind of make the world go round. It's mm-hmm. like you and I are collaborating on this project right now of having an interview. And it's because like... Um, I don't know why you're doing it. I'm doing it because I'm interested in hearing what you have to say. I think it'll be a really fun conversation. And I imagine that maybe you have similar motivations. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as a result, like we're able to like make something beautiful, hopefully. I mean, I don't know what's mm-hmm. going to happen in the next few minutes. I mean, it'll go horribly awful. <laughs> but like at the moment, things seem to be going very well. Mm-hmm. And like you might think that part of like showing respect for somebody is having these kinds of group projects with them. And so I think it's it's crucial if non-human animals are going to be citizens and if they're going to have citizenship rights and we're going to afford them all these, these other things, that we create social structures that allow them to also contribute meaningfully to group projects with us. Mm-hmm. And they should be group projects that benefit them. It should be group projects that they, um, that they want to participate in. Um, but I could see, and I can't see how eggs could ever be something like that. But I could see in some like other world really far down the line, like decades from now, once we've eradicated like all farming and uh, sorry, all all animal farming, other farming we need. um, Mm -hmm. And we're able to just kind of like shear the alpacas and have it be part of this like process where they're just maybe they go up to like a natural shearing post in the woods and then the stuff gets collected and and stuff Um, like. I don't know. What do you? Th- I just threw a lot at you, but maybe you want to respond. I mean, yeah, I think that that's kind of I, um, sort of like yeah, I definitely got that impression from Zoopolis that um, like with citizenship there comes this expectation of contribution to the community, and um, I think that. Uh, we just have to be very careful with that. And I guess that maybe that's that's just kind of, maybe it's just taking this more radical stance even beyond um, Zoopolis's position in that like, in, in order to, um, like in order to, in, in that maybe what reparations would mean um, is that we just try to, like 
be so careful about this because we have because there's nothing we could ever do to make up for all of the um all of the injustice that that we've caused and so maybe if you don't believe in reparations or if you um don't think or if you think that reparations at some point will no longer be necessary um then i can see like where that position like you know the reasoning behind that position maybe um but i think i mean uh i think that i like just with the reality of the climate crisis and everything i'm just not sure that we'll get there and so if we're actually talking about things that um i mean obviously like as philosophers we're always like talking about like the ideal and like that's not a bad thing to talk about like you know what what does this like utopia look like for animals and and whatnot but like for animal rights activism which is predominantly what i feel is the most important like for the applications of philosophy if we're using this to actually influence our activism and our relationships with animals um then we should just be doing everything that we can um to dismantle human supremacy and i think that right now that definitely means like doing like trying so so hard to make sure that you're like not violating animals consent and like not you know trying to uh like push what you want onto them and like make assumptions about what they want uh because that's just what we've been doing this whole time and look where that led us <laughs> yeah no i i definitely see that um i i think like two points i want to i want to make so like one of them is that in the first chapter it's been a while since i've read it so you've read it much more recently than me, but like in the first chapter of zoopolis they're framing themselves as like the animal rights has failed animal welfare has failed we need to try something new let's go for citizenship and it seems like you don't buy that because you think that's sort of as a a matter of practical political positioning, um, that's not the dialectically strongest position. Is that is that part of what you're saying? Maybe I um, I this was my like first introduction to citizenship theory in sure. general, so I'm kind of like interested in um, like my professor and I have talked a little bit about like some critiques uh, like of citizenship theory and its application to humans, and so I'm kind of like interested in that, like especially when it comes to um, like the denizenship aspect uh, in in that it hasn't really been applied uh, justly to humans. And so is there a way to actually apply that justly to animals? So uh, yeah, I don't know. I think, I, I think that a really important aspect of what they did was when they um, are, are talking about like understanding um, like our relationships with different kinds of animals and that like we're going to owe different things to you know a cat who lives with me than to a wild cat like who you know I may never meet and um and their emphasis on the fact that we don't really talk much about our impact even like on wild animals and on liminal animals like we, we don't even talk about liminal animals really in main animal rights theory so I think that that what they did there was really great and um and defining those different relationships is really great. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about citizenship theory uh, it, as a, a theory in general, though. Good. Um, no, we're, we're agreeing on so much, just so our viewers understand. So, like, um, denizenship, so we should explain what denizenship and liminal animals are. So, like, you have domesticated animals like dogs, and dogs have been sort of selectively bred by humans, and we have these kinds of relationships with them. And because of the kinds of like breeding that we've done and the relationships we've built up, it seems possible that we could, they could help us determine the collective good. So that's why they see them as like candidates for citizenship. But then you have wild animals and Zoopolis think, then Zoopolis, uh, Donaldson and Kim Licka think that um, these animals are like, like, like deer, um, 
uh, that they should involves they should just sort of have the status of like sovereign nations we sort of like leave them alone respect them the way that we respect other sovereign nations and then liminal animals are sort of in the middle so they're like pigeons and squirrels and chipmunks and all these individuals who uh, have sort of evolved alongside us and who kind of depend on our societies and, and structures for certain kinds of um, goods, but who aren't fully domesticated. And the thought there is that they should get denizen denizenship. Yeah, denizenship. I don't know why I'm having trouble with the word, um, which is similar to what we might afford to uh, refugees. So like refugees coming to the country, they don't have full citizenship. They, maybe they don't get to vote, um, but they should still have their interests taken care of in ways that individuals not even associated with our, our country in any way um, wouldn't. And, and I think, so the point you're making, I think, is that um, it's really kind of important that we're separating between our duties to wild animals, our duties to liminal animals, and our duties to domesticated animals in coming up with like a, what a just order would look like. Is that, is that mm -hmm. fair? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think that the um, denizenship section is just probably like the weakest in that like we don't really have a, and, and this isn't really their fault like in, in any way. It's just that we don't even really have good examples to point to in the human case. Whereas like it seems like we've done like a lot of improvement um, in, in how um, like our understanding of, of citizenship and and maybe we're doing like an okay job in, in like respecting the sovereignty of nations maybe but like <laughs> it, it's just like uh but with with denizenship it's like can you even like point to like a country that that does that in a good way and where people are um you know really treated as um like as full persons like i'm not really convinced i guess we're supposed to be like according to the statue of liberty we just don't yeah i mean as someone who's married to a non-citizen i <laughs> yeah i feel like very um strongly obviously that we don't so <laughs> yeah um no that that's that's powerful so the other point you made though is that we should be doing everything we can to dismantle human supremacism like given the kinds of world that we live in and I think that the the sort of counter argument on behalf of Zoopolis, I mean, they're not going to argue against that. But I think what they're going to argue for is like mutually beneficial relationships where we depend on each other and, and care for each other um, are going to be part of dismantling human supremacy because we mm -hmm. stop seeing, and I, I would be going a little bit out on a limb here, but it, I think one thing that they could say, which I don't know if they do, because it's been a couple of years since I've read it, is that um, by building these kinds of relationships, we kind of like demystify them. And instead of just seeing them as like individuals who exist completely outside of our society and, you know, we can think about them in a museum or something like, you know, the context of like seeing museum exhibits about them. Um, instead of doing that, like by working with them and building these kinds of mutually beneficial relationships where like we use them and they use us, that might be a way of dismantling human supremacy by creating situations of mutually beneficial collaboration mm -hmm. and i think that you, like you probably agree with 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 some of that and it just might be that there's like a question about which types of use to foster that project and which types of use just foster human supremacism and are just excuses they're just we think we found loopholes is that, is that fair yeah yeah i agree i mean i think that you know um often uh, like when we meet someone who like isn't who's not vegan not familiar with animal rights at all and they'll be like oh what so you want to take my pets away and like you know that that kind of thing and it's like so much the opposite like it, it's so much that like we uh, I, I mean I think that relationships with animals can be beautiful can can be um, you know wonderful uh relationships mutually where there's uh you know um mutual benefit from them uh but i i don't think that um most people like have that with their um with with the animals that that they call pets and i think that like what we're trying to do is is move them in that direction rather than the opposite one 
where there is no relationship at all. And I think that um, through relationships is um, is how we can learn about about their needs. And I think that that's like one of the things that like they touch upon it in Zoopolis is that like is I mean if we're talking about positive rights as a whole, like how would you even know like what um, you know what kind of medicine a chicken might need if if like you haven't you know built this relationship to understand like what's wrong with them and if they're like displaying abnormal behavior and whatnot. Um, and so it's not even is it just like uh, like in, important for for us as individuals like to to have these relationships, but it's also like super important for the movement like it it's um it's how we're able to hopefully show the rest of the world the um you know wonderful amazing beings these animals are uh and to amplify their voices in that way it happens through our relationships happens through the existence of sanctuaries uh and yeah 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 i, I love that so it's like we need relationships because if we don't have the relationships, we're not going to um, be able to know what their needs are. We're not going to be able to build these kinds of mutually respectful relationships. Um, but maybe relationships, good um, use, maybe stay away from that for now. Um, yeah. It might be the case that later down the line, we can find cases of use that are mutually beneficial. But right now, I think the temptation to kind of uh, cook the data in our favor is kind of a little bit scary. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think that maybe like one, uh, I think something that is, is an example of something that possibly could be like more relevant to um, what the authors of Zoopolis are like trying to get at might be, um, you know, the um, increasing popularity of emotional support animals. And that like, if, um, if, you know, you uh, have like uh, some sort of emotional uh, disability or whatnot where you benefit from companionship from an animal and that animal like seems to feel a similar way and really values being with you and comforting you, then, um, you know, I don't think that we should, uh, should feel negatively about this. I think that that's actually um you know a, a possibility of you know more of what that looks like because i think that there's a lot more um de definitive uh like we can what we can point to definitively as consent on the animal's part um and obviously then there's just like the logistical benefits of like animals who are emotional support animals unfortunately like they have the like greater access to like respect in our society and like being able to you know be on uh like on the act in the passenger area of airplanes and like easier to um you know find housing with them when landlords aren't allowed to uh impose like as strict um restrictions so yeah i definitely you know sometimes that comes up in like the more uh like picky things of like what we uh, are okay with in animal rights. And I, I see absolutely nothing wrong with that. Good. I like that. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I totally see how you can say that and be consistent because that's a case where it seems like it's a relationship and it seems like the dog or cat or whoever they are um, is going to be, they're, they're not going to make it as an emotion. They're not going to become an emotional support animal if they hate giving emotional support. Like if yeah, it's I mean, a dog. I, hope. I mean, yeah, it, like as long as you're actually respecting that, because I'm sure that there are people who abuse that in the way that, and like anyone can abuse anything. But yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. No, I, I like that. Um, cool. So one thing I, I think we're we've been going for like an hour and fifteen minutes. And I think this is good. There's one topic that I want to make sure that we talked about sort of like before the end. Um, one thing that when I think of Amanda Hudichel, I think of somebody who's really careful about the use of language. And even in this call, like you referred to fishes, not to fish. And uh, I brought up earlier about how like Pansy is this pit bull who 
I'm like, I guess she's like a roommate of mine. I, I adopted her and I, um, I don't know how to talk about that. I don't have an awkward, I don't have anything that's as unawkward as my dog. And mm-hmm. so what I'm wondering is like, could you talk a little about the importance of language and sort of like using language to dismantle speciesism and also like, what practical advice do you have for me so that I can go on and have like easy conversations while not contributing to speciesism? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, language is uh, important for multiple reasons. Um, it's the way that predominantly we're going to be communicating our animal rights message with others. And uh, also it just people notice. And uh, so not, not only does it affect the way that um, you using anti-speciesist language will actually start to think about these issues through using certain words, um, but it also, I think it's just a strategic tool if you wanna think about it uh, in strictly like uh, efficacy terms in that um, when I say fishes instead of fish, like obviously, people notice that and sometimes people uh, do ask me like why are you using this word instead of that or um, uh, and yeah I mean it it comes up in a variety of different contexts and um, so I I think that it's it's important for um, but I think anybody no matter uh, if you think that there's like you know, oh, like people were just being like too PC or whatever, like you can still find like a reason to think that this is important. Um, like we're not trying to police people's language in, um, you know, saying that if you say my dog, like you're wrong or and that like you shouldn't say that and like, you know, like be the vegan police or whatever. Um, I think that we're just like, all trying to talk about animals in the most respectful way possible. Like hopefully we're all in the same boat of like, we want to represent them as best we can. And a lot of the time that happens through language and just their simple word choice of using one word instead of instead of the other. Um, so yeah, I think that, um, that uh, for specifically the issue of saying like my dog or my cat, um, I think the good alternatives for that, um, probably like the least awkward is just saying my dog companion. Um, my, yeah, I think that, that that's the easiest if um, some people might like prefer to like say, um, you know, my canine roommate or something like that. Um, but I definitely think dog companion is like um, the easiest. And what happens is that instead of, um, you know, uh, only using their species as like the definition of, uh, you know, more of an ownership aspect, when you add companion on the end, it becomes a relationship. And you could easily, um, you know, call uh, any other uh, human that you're friends with, uh, you know, call them your your companion, and dog just becomes a descriptor of the kind of companion that they are. Um, so, yeah, I Got think that I like that's that. obviously one of the more awkward ones to to do, um, and it's not it's not as obvious as um, you know, not calling animals it or not calling them things or whatnot it's kind of like the more advanced like anti-speciesist language but um i definitely have tried to uh implement that and feel like i'm like pretty much doing that all the time now that's cool well i'll, I'll start using um dog companion and i like the way you put it because it's like she's my companion and dog modifies that rather than saying she's my dog where that defines our relationship like it's it's a dog human relationship rather than like a companion. Yeah, I like that. It's really cool. Um, I also like the point about like, you know, this isn't about policing language. It's not about like Amanda and Abaji swooping down like gonna, you know, all that kind of thing. It's more that like if if we're all together in this collective project of trying to live better with non-human animals, um, how can we do it? And we've sort of started and ended with the idea of 
of character. So it's sort of like, you know, sort of woven through here like a thread. Like, I think we started with this idea of what, what Amanda's character was like back when she was um, in high school doing her first disruption. And then we get to the idea of what, what prison did, <laughs> what Yale did to your character. Um, it seems like it didn't do anything bad. Um, <laughs> we get to this idea of like what a disruption is. And it's like, it's sort of the, it's like the authentic expression of a good character given the unjust world that we're living in, the fact there's dead bodies everywhere when we go into a grocery store. Mm -hmm. And we talked about like the importance of character when we're thinking about how shearing a alpaca for wool and selling the wool might hurt our character because it might turn us into people who just how to use this. And I think that I think, of, I mean, one way of sort of ending might be to say that the, uh, when you're talking about language and sort of the importance of language, we're talking about developing our character in a very intimate way where we're thinking about the content of our thoughts and the ways that we like shape our thoughts and how we form sentences. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you're, you're really sort of pointing to like a really kind of, I don't know, like just, I use the word intimate, but that's the best one I come up with, like a really sort of intimate way that we, um, that we are and that, that we exist, just the ways that we represent the world to ourselves using words. Um, and so like you're giving us quite an important gift by focusing a lot of attention on anti-species language because it's an opportunity to develop our character in a really minute kind of way that we often don't get the chance to. So thank you for that. Thank you. Yeah, I, I love the way that you put that. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so we have one question in the chat that I think we should respond to briefly. Um, and it's sort of an expansion of what something we were talking about a little bit earlier. And this question is, what are your thoughts on service animals, including search dogs? <laughs> mm -hmm. And so I imagine I know what you're going to say about like police dogs. Probably no. <laughs> I imagine for dogs in the military, you're also going to say probably no. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you could comment on search and rescue dogs and then maybe seeing eye dogs. Because that does seem like it's qualitatively distinct from the kinds of emotional support animals that you were talking about earlier or who you were talking about earlier? <laughs> um, so I think uh, probably one of the things that I think Abhiji, uh made a post about this that like better than I could even articulate. Um, so I um, would probably like point people to that, maybe like comment um, a, a link to that post. But basically in summary, um, he uh, made this really great point, I think, that when we talk only, like, exclusively about, um, like, the theoretical issues uh, with these animals and in, in that, like, it is exploitative, like, there's no question about that, but is that actually something that we should be focusing on right now? And this is not to say, oh, like, there's so many more issues, but this is actually to say like in real life, these animals probably are like living a better life than many, many, uh, you know, animals used as pets. And so to say that like, uh, because they had, you know, they're able to be with their, hu with their human, like in way more um, spaces than the average animal is able to go to, um, Obviously, there's, you know, also uh, in, in the same way that ESAs are able to have access to airplanes and housing, like that uh, is, a, is applicable to service animals, but even to, you know, a, a much larger extent. Um, and so I don't think I would like want a ban on service animals right now, because I think that uh that when we only really have like these two alternatives with like maybe emotional support animals is like kind of an in-between. But when mostly you're talking about like a pet who like doesn't have access um, to go like into a restaurant, a store, like anywhere in the public really, uh, who will have to be in the baggage area of a plane, um, who like isn't you know like uh, who is just very limited in in um in their mobility uh and then our our alternative is 
okay, you can do these things, but then you're also going to be used for the purpose of, um, you know, being someone's eyes, uh, that these are two, uh, like, shitty, you know, uh, like, it's, it's a dichotomy that, like, we're faced with, and that, um, that, that, like, this is our reality, I guess. And uh, I don't think that the correct answer is to blanket statement say being a pet is always going to be the better situation, I guess. And I know that that doesn't really answer like the complete ethics of um, like of, you know, uh, uh, seeing eye dogs and search animals as a whole. I think search animals is like a little bit different, I guess. I haven't really thought like a ton about that specifically, but like I have thought about um, this issue of um, of service animals, and uh, yeah, I think that it's just a more complex issue can't be answered simply. Yeah, I love that. So I think there's. I want to see if I can make sure I got everything. So I think there's like two major points. One of them is to say that it's not the case that. So you're against banning service animals. That's one thing I hear. Another thing I hear is that you're against committing the speech act of saying all service animal use should stop. Um, And I think that there might be two reasons why you're saying that. I think one of them is that you, like it's actually not as bad as a lot of situations of pet ownership. So for a lot of these um, these dogs, um, it could be a step up. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think another thing is to say that you might also be denying that there's a publicity requirement for ethical theories. I want to be really clear about what I mean by that. Um, Henry Sedgwick was a famous utilitarian philosopher um, from the 19th century. He's one of my favorite. And he has this this quote uh, where he talks about how um, he he thought it would be a really bad idea if everybody found out about the truth of utilitarianism. Because everybody finds out about it, that it's true, like the, there's bad stuff that's going to happen because most of us aren't good enough at calculating utility to calculate it well. Mm-hmm. And so like what he said was like most people should be like encouraged to never calculate utility. And maybe we should even tell them that it's that the theory is false. Maybe we should even lie to them, tell them that the theory is false. Mm-hmm. And I kind of like I'm the kind of utilitarian that kind of agrees with him. Right? I think that. Maybe I'm doing something wrong by telling people that utilitarianism is is the correct theory, because in general, I want them to not um, think of think. I want them to typically not be engaging utility calculations. Um, I think even I shouldn't be engaging utility calculations, and I don't think I'm unintelligent. It's just that I think typically, um, when we do that, that's not the best way of maximizing utility. So the correct act isn't to do that. And all this was sort of a roundabout way of saying that. Um, it might turn out that at the end of the day, the correct position is that the, it's still bad. It might turn out that service animal use is bad because it's still use and it still contributes to speciesism. But it might turn out also that we kind of have an obligation to not tell people that it's bad, at least right now, because the effects of doing that are going to be worse than the effects of not telling them that it's bad. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. I think we definitely have a responsibility to be thinking like what good will come of this. And I am also not opposed to just saying like, yeah, there's there's priorities. Like, even though I really enjoy talking about language, like I definitely don't think that's like, you know, on par with actually talking about the consumption of animal bodies, like to, an- to any extent. I'm not going around like uh, talking to non-vegans, like saying that they, you know, shouldn't call animals it because obviously, like, if you call an animal he or she but still eat them, then that doesn't really matter so much. So, uh, yeah, I think that that we should. It's definitely okay for us to just be like, well, as long as we have this dichotomy, as long as we don't really have very many strong protections for animals who are seen as pets. Um, and that, that isn't necessarily like the best alternative, um, for, for many dogs, uh, if we're talking about dogs, like in particular, then, um, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with just like, all right, we're going to table this until we have like a better society. Um, yeah. Good. Excellent. Well, I think this has, this has been good. Um, anything else you wanted to talk about before, before we close? I mean, there's always so much that yeah, yeah. like you 
you know, I could talk about it then. Um, but yeah, I yeah. think that this has been great. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. We'll I'll have to have you back sometime to talk about a more list of things you want to do. Um, well, so thanks so much, Matt. It's been really great having you. Um, thanks too much for our, too much for our viewers. We have a bunch of people that have logged on for different parts of this and, um, it's going to be, you know, you can watch it on Facebook later. Um, if you watch this and you have questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and, um, I'll respond to them. I'll, I'll let Amanda know about them if she doesn't see them. Uh, I'll just do two really quick plugs. So I'm going to be talking at the, the Milwaukee Vegan Soul Food and Expo, um, Soul Food and Drink Expo this, this Saturday at 2 p.m. I'm going to be talking about infighting. So the ethics of infighting, like what is it, when does it help us, when does it not help us, and how can we have sort of healthy relationships towards infighting, because it's neither all good nor all bad. And um, also if you want to sort of learn more about some of the philosophical ideas that we covered in, in this, this discussion, I run an online philosophy for vegans course that I'm always open to more, more students taking it. So um, just feel free to reach out if you're interested in that. Um, and Amanda, do you have any things coming up that you want to announce? Um, well, it's like everyone can just, uh, if you would like to see more about, um, about the kind of work that I do, um, along with, uh, Abhijit Mudaganti, give us a like at, at Species Revolution on Facebook or follow us on Instagram or Twitter. Uh, Abhijit has a really great blog post, hopefully coming out soon. It's been delayed by all of the, um, Kaporos stuff that we didn't even get a chance to talk about. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're always excited, uh, to, um, share, uh, those kinds of things with everyone. Awesome. Yes. Definitely follow Speeds Revolution and I will look forward to reading that because that's a fascinating topic. <laughs> All right, cool. All right. So I'm going to end this stream now. I think I can do that by going into this program and clicking stop streaming. Cool. Um, I'll rate this and I'll click done. Oh, I should stop recording too.